And so we are going to kick off with our first invited talk session. First up, we have Albert Cohen of Michigan State University. So Albert Cohen is the interim director of the actuarial science program at MSU, in addition to directing MSU's graduate certificate in sports analytics, brand new program. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, very fitting for homecoming weekend, uh, under the supervision of David Kinderleher. And his research focuses on the interaction between probability in science, sports, and financial economics. So I'm going to turn it over to Albert, uh, stop talking, and he's going to talk about player contract valuation, something I think is pretty different than most talks you might have seen in sports analytics conferences, coming at it from a math finance point of view. Should be fun. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Isn't it amazing to be here? I mean, this is something that doesn't happen very often when what you love to do and what you have skills in converge. And so I, I was just talking with Sarah a little bit. I grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I was doing that. My mom's Brazilian, so Portuguese is my first language. I also grew up loving soccer. But I grew up in the 80s in Canada, which meant Wayne Gretzky, Yari Curry, Mark Messier. But Vancouver, our misery index is kind of high. But I'm still a Canucks fan. You know, I'm, I'm holding steady. I mean, this year has been a good year. But uh, so far, I shouldn't jinx it. Uh, but absolutely. So I did my undergraduate and master's at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, or Burnaby, which has also got a very good sports analytics program that's bubbling up. Uh, they compete in the Big Data Bowl as well. Uh, but when I came here to Pittsburgh, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I got caught by the probability bug. My advisor told me to talk to everybody, and he gave me some new problems to work on. Uh, and so the skills that I learned, I applied to a thesis in stochastic analysis applied to coarsening of grain networks, but my training was also in mathematical finance. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But one of my favorite things to talk about is Moneyball Theorem, because everybody knows about this. Everybody talks about it. Everybody says, hey, have you seen the character? Um, you know, I actually share the same birthday. I forget his name. The gentleman that actually goes and points and says, hey, this is Moneyball. This is your buying wins. Uh, in any case, so everybody knows this, everybody's heard about this, and we're actually going to use the Moneyball theorem, Pythagorean theorem, Bill Saber's theorem, uh, sorry, um, Bill James' theorem, Saber metrics, to do some pricing. Oh, sorry, okay. So, uh, funny enough, this happens a lot in academia. Gerald Scully, who is a labor econometrist, basically set the stage for this. He said that, okay, fine, how do you properly compensate somebody for their on-field play? And so the answer was, well, marginal revenue product. That just simply means that for every dollar they bring in, you give them a portion of that. If they bring in more money, they should get paid more. That's a fair way of compensation. So based on that, well, how about, can we involve business analytics? Can we involve how the revenue that's generated is also related to increased ticket sales, increased ticket prices, more you know, improvements to the stadium that we can you know, fund back into the team? And so Dwayne Rockerby is also from Western Canada, University of Lethbridge. In 2010, he published Moneyball Redux, where they look at free agents in baseball, and they propose some models we're going to work with. So specifically, can we figure out how the winning percentage Y, this is a macro statistic for the team. So winning percentage Y is just w uh, wins over wins plus losses. So if we look at this, how does Y affect directly the revenue? Well, your play as a player affects winning percentage. Winning percentage can now affect revenue. So that middle step is what we're trying to do. I have my, my Spartan Army here. We have four students here that are here from the Sports Analytics Club, and they're working on a neural network approach to this, and that's fantastic. But a way to maybe have that extra step that you can communicate with folks in marketing, in business analytics, is to say, okay, fine, how do we do that? So we'll talk about this. One way to look at the Pythagorean theorem of baseball is to say that wins over wins plus losses is approximately equal to runs squared over runs squared plus opposing runs squared. Now that exponent gamma, gamma equals two, there's no universal law, it has to be that way, and you can tweak it a little bit. I've seen about around 1.8 for baseball. But the question would be is what happens if gamma goes to zero, and what happens if gamma goes to infinity? For example, Daryl Morey, one of the Sloan sports guys, he said for basketball, gamma's around 14. So this is the teacher in me coming out. Anybody, what happens if you have a high gamma versus a low gamma? What does that tell you about the team? <laughs> yes, sir. More variance. 
Kind of. So if gamma goes to zero, you've got one over one plus one or a half, which means that any sort of run differential is just a coin flip. But as gamma gets bigger and bigger, so like in basketball, any slight point differential means that you have a higher chance of winning that game or having a higher winning percentage in general. Okay, so Pythagorean theorem is great for baseball, but also hockey, even individual sports like tennis, people are talking about this. And so looking at the macro statistics, for example, runs scored, runs given up, you can look at all in-game play is affecting those two macro variables. But there are other things you can track as well. So the Rockerby model from this Moneyball Redox says, okay, fine, let's take the log likelihood, the logarithm of y over one minus y, and let's say that it's just gonna be linearly dependent on some base factor delta plus some weighting of inputs x1 through xn. Excuse me. And then we can say, okay, fine, revenue is just the price of an average ticket times the demand at that price level, which is just P times, okay, some base demand, let's say season ticket holders, and now A1 times P, A2 times Y, and we'll shove everything into that. Like how many games did you finish out of first? Did you make the playoffs or not? You know, what's the average driving distance to your stadium? All of that just shove into those two. But you can say that, look, A1, as you increase the price, the demand might go down. All right, so this marginal effect A1 we're interested in. And oops, and A2 over here, for every basis point you increase your winning percentage, you're probably gonna have more demand. And so, as you can see, there's a balancer, there's a seesaw. So, everybody's favorite Saturday morning topic, multivariable calculus, okay? <laughs> so we say that, look, the marginal revenue product, or DR for some player I under consideration, is just the sum of di r, di xj, dxj for this player i. And now, we're gonna use a sigmoidal function or just simply chain rule. Di r, di xj is di r, di y, di y, di xj, dxj. And wait a minute, wait a minute, I think, and again, this is where the chain rule comes in, from equation two, I can now do that multivariable calculus. Fantastic, so now this is it. So this time we're actually gonna use Moneyball or another sort of winning percentage fit to do this. Okay, so here's something else again, this is the crowd participation here. Marginal revenue product, A2, if you remember A2 was that effect for Y, times Y, times one minus Y, times the sum of these weights that you have on the individual increments for the total season of the player. So if you sign a free agent player, how many extra runs does he account for positively, and how many runs does he uh, deny the opposing team? That's it. But here's something interesting. Y times one minus Y, where is that maximized? 25. Exactly, so for a 500 level team, and there's no general law of the universe that a 500 level team is gonna overspend on a free agent, but <laughs> it kinda passes the smell test a little bit. So, what if you wanted to do the same thing for actual Pythagorean theorem and just leave gamma in front as a free parameter? There you go, but again, you can kind of tell Pythagorean theorem is sort of like a sigmoidal function just using a logarithmic transformation. So, that's the formula there for Pythagorean if you want to do this. But again, you tell me how, ex how many extra runs you support or deny, or both, with your play, because you could be a pitcher, you could be a hitter, you could have more focus on one or the other, or in any sport. And I can tell you now this product. And we're actually gonna do some numbers together. So, how do we do this? Um, I'm not an economist, I'm just a simple mathematician that wandered in here, and thank you for letting me, because I do some coding now. Again, it's the Spartan Army, they do fantastic work. Um, but for me, instead of doing elasticity or any of these sort of fancy things, just 90% you know, of the estimated marginal revenue product. And in a salary cap league, that's not so bad. I think the NHL is a 50-50 split, right? So you're getting 50% of the total revenue, give them 90% of that. Whatever you determine, as long as you're consistent, that's okay. Now, this again, I think it was a George Box that all models are wrong, some are useful. This is not truth, but this is just sort of a, a, a starting point, a foundational way to think about things. Like Black-Scholes, like Black-Scholes for pricing options is great to explain, but if I was to walk into the bank and say, hey, I'm a Black Scholes guy, they'll give me a nice box and say, you can take your stuff and go. Right, I mean, having Black Scholes with constant parameters doesn't fit the market, but it's a really great sort of pedagogical tool. And I believe this is a good way to think about things too. 
So, some numbers here. Let's say we have a base demand of 7,500 uh, season ticket holders. We have, uh, for every uh, dollar that you increase, your average ticket price, you lose 100 uh, people that maybe would walk up or people that cancel their season tickets. We have this 4,000, which is multiplying times Y, and Y is the number between zero and one. So I guess 40 extra people for every basis point that you bring in. And let's assume, I just pull these numbers out of the air, that we're offensively I'm interested, so five and minus three, and there is my sigmoidal function that, uh, for my probability, that rocker B puts. Excuse me. So does this make sense? 7,500 people base, you know, there's a certain carrying capacity of any stadium. What does this number show us? Well, plug it in our numbers. And now for an average ticket price of 50 per game for a 500 level team, there's my formula. And now, okay, plug in the rest, which is how many extra runs I'm gonna support and deny. And there you go, your game check looks at around 292,500. Okay, so again, I should be careful. This is for a player that per game is expected to drive in uh, overall during his play for one extra run and then deny a half run. So he's offensively minded. On an offensively minded team that's seeking his services, we're gonna value his game check at 292,000. So let's say this is baseball. Let's say an average of 150 games. You know, let's say 10 games or so lost to injury, whatever it is. Can somebody pull out a calculator? What's 292 five times 150? I deal with actuaries, they love it, man. Like when you tell them they're like salivating, yes. Sure. You know, yes sir. Yeah, does that seem about right for a good baseball salary? Okay, so again, these are just numbers. I'm not saying that I calibrated to anything. I'm just pulled out some numbers. Let's try this again with gamma equals two. Let's use Bill James formula without tweaking it. <coughs> but in the same numbers, and again, now my game check is $27,000. So again, for 150, you're looking at around 4 million. So whatever you decide to use will matter, but again, as long as you're consistent, this is a nice sanity check. So you're going to do cohort analysis, and that's sort of the, the elephant in the room here. I'm not comparing to a cohort of other possible free agents. I'm not using liquidity. So in finance, we talk about, you know, can I buy this asset? Well, there not, might not only be more than two of them around there, and we have this in sports all the time. You might not be able to find a left-handed defenseman you know, especially one that will play well with your team, right? So that liquidity, that scarcity comes into play. Okay, once you decide which probability model you wanna use, the numbers will come out and you're gonna run this over and over for players and see if things are consistent. So in general, I wanted to do a kind of a quicker talk and then open it up for discussion. What we've done here is instead of taking the standard approach where I'm just gonna regress, for example, Chadwick Bureau, Sean Lehman writes for the USA Today. He's got 150 years worth of baseball data. Some of the contributors have got about 40 years worth of pitcher data. So we did that. As soon as we did that, if you just regress on wins, losses, and saves, your R squared is about 0.05, 0.06, if I remember correctly, something like this. And so if you regress on all 31 macro and micro variables, your R squared goes up to about 0.8, which is reasonable. Neural networks can take it further. You know, other sort of advanced uh, methods can take it further. But this is essentially, like I say, sanity check. You've got these prices that everybody else is paying, but does it link up to revenue? And again, being Canadian and being a Canucks fan, Brian Burke, who has some residents here in Pittsburgh as well, he has this great video on um, Hey Berkey. This is his podcast that he does on Sportsnet, and he talks about the time that Vancouver could have signed Wayne Gretzky. So if you remember the story, Peter Pocklington had a meatpacking plant, and I think he was, he was looking for around 25 million for Wayne Gretzky, and Brian Burke under Pac Wynn said, can't do that, how about 15? Because he said, I ran the numbers. And if you have a chance, Google this on YouTube, it's just, hey Berkey, Wayne Gretzky, this will come up. If you see this, he talks about, well, I looked at the average number of luxury boxes in the Pacific Coliseum, there's about 12. And I looked at our average ticket price back then, I know this is crazy, 25 bucks, what if we raised it to 30? still couldn't swing the numbers. So again, when you're doing valuation of, of a player's services as an asset, you also have to balance it with revenue. Now, revenue streams are very different than they were in the 90s, obviously. But still, I do think that this is a good way to at least verify what you're thinking about paying this person. Again, cohort free, this does not depend on the people that you're judging against, the liquidity, any of that. 
So, um, if you're curious about some more resources, and I think I went pretty quick today, Dwayne Rockerby, Stephen Easton, this is in Springer, Contract Options for Buyers and uh, Sellers of Talent and Professional Sports. They do this now for what I'd say is a multi-period model. So if you've ever done uh, Dmitry Kramkov, who is one of my mentors here, uh, he used to teach in the MSCF, this multi-period asset pricing course, and that's exactly what this is. You have binomial, trinomial models, and you look at the optionality of one two-year contract versus two one-year contracts. Everything I've done here, by the way, is for a single year. And that's sort of the fun thing. We're at uh, Michigan State, some of my students were taking this course with me. We're doing contract pricing where we look at really three out of four sectors. One player for one year, covered that today. One player for multiple years, this stuff over here, contract options. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about what we're doing. Multiple players for a single season. This is fun because if you look at each player, you know, drawing a certain percentage of a salary cap, then the question is, how do you apportion that? It's sort of like when you're doing uh, basket investing. Right, so you've got $1,000, how much should you invest in asset A, asset B, and so on? And then how do you do that that's also based on what we call a risk neutral measure, which is what the market determines some of these values to be. And so we do that. The last one is you'd have to be Scotty Bowman, which is multiple players for multiple years and doing it successfully. I don't think any mathematician is going to tell you how to do that. So with that in mind, I want to finish it and just open up for questions. A lot of people I want to thank, Ron, Sam, and Rebecca. You know, as a fellow alum, you know, your heart is in the work, as we say here, and I appreciate this. Uh, my advisor, David Kindler, trained me and unleashed me on all of you guys. Uh, Dimitri Kramkov, Stephen Shreve were my mentors in the comp finance program. Jeff and Keith, our current and former chairs, Emilio and Leonard, who I work with in a second. Uh, James Risk and I are working on a sort of adaptation of this paper here, which I think is also foundational, which is a Black-Scholes pricing approach to pricing soccer players' uh, contracts. This came out in 2005. They've done some extra work on it. I had to say 2010, Coluccia, they did some work on the Serie A, again, the Black-Scholes pricing model, but they didn't do the full numerics, in my opinion, so we're going to try to do some of that. And so James and I, we out of Cal State Pomona. And I keep referencing the Spartan Army. So there's something unique about Michigan State, which I want to share with all of you. The number 11 NCAA hockey team has a sports analytics or a hockey analytics team, and it's those gentlemen up there. That's how we do things at Michigan State. You know, and that comes from really the training I got here, which is that we empower everybody. We don't care. You know, as long as you're interested, you want to work with us, we want to work with you. And so what we've done is we've bottled that a little bit. And so now we actually have a new graduate certificate. I'm teaching the first course in machine learning. And we also have Leonard Johnson, who's teaching the statistics and visualization. And then Emilio is teaching the uh, capstone course. And then we also have a project development class that we're hopefully going to announce very, very soon. We'll have somebody from industry that's going to be teaching that. That's four courses over two semesters. 1250 a credit, you're going to get four uh, MSU 800 level graduate credits in math and stats. And if you have a chance, you can either put in the um, website or take a picture of the QR code. We would love to have you. Everything is there. We've got a two-minute program video. We've got the registration links or the application links. Any information you would like is up there. So with that, um, I didn't want to go over my time because I know as mathematicians we talk a lot. So I wanted to save about five or 10 minutes. So open up for questions. All right, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Well, uh, of PhD student Kuang Wen come around. I'll ask if you speak in that answer. Hi, I was just wondering with the, um, the model you were talking about with um, kind of measuring the value of a player in terms of runs added and runs prevented. How would that work for a sport like football where there's much more moving parts? And like, for example, players that aren't on the ball, like offensive linemen, they can be schemed. Like if, if an offensive lineman isn't necessarily up to scratch, they can scheme around that. And so it might not show in the numbers. So what might be a way that you can account for that when modeling their value if you know that a team is kind of actively trying to cover up their weaknesses. 
I appreciate it, my friend. So I'm going to steal a page from Sarah and talk about the other football, which is in soccer, right? I mean, goals are infrequent, points are infrequent in general. And so you're going to look at maybe a passing network. Uh, Pena and some of his colleagues in 2012, they did an analysis of the 2010 uh, World Cup, and they talked about centrality measures like closeness, page rank centrality. And so we're, that's actually you're kind of hitting on what we're doing, James and I. We're looking at a different way of doing this that for other sports where there is more nuance, how do you do this value and let it out a little bit, we're looking at the fractional value of the total play. And so instead of the actual direct numbers, you're absolutely right. In a sport like baseball or things where points are, like basketball where points are <coughs> abundant, if you're looking at the nuance of individual play, you're looking at a team approach and we're looking at the fractional version of that. So thank you, it's a, that's a very incisive question. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just talk. Um, so, Actually, it's, it's for the other. Yeah, it's for the other. We'll go here first. We'll get you the problem. Um, for your A1 term that you had in your initial model, that's dependent on price. Do you find that that term in your research is that term really a linear term? Is it more a non-linear function that depends on price levels? Absolutely, yes. I mean, they're, they're carrying capacity. I mean, it's, it can't go up forever. You're absolutely right. People only have so much money. And you're absolutely right. There are business cycles. There's recessive cycles, like, you know, things that we're seeing now, inflationary cycles. So, yes, um, it is the very first ground level approach. But you're right. Nonlinearity is the way to go. Hi, sorry about that. Um, so if you were to look at free agency players and maybe players in the draft and kind of assign them value based on their contracts and then based off their value based on performance, is there a way to kind of determine whether or not those signings and contracts are overvalued um, in terms of, again, their contract and then performance? So let's say like the first pick in a draft is exponentially has an exponentially higher contract than let's say the 14th and 30th pick so would trading down for those two guys essentially be more valuable in the long run than that presumably overvalued first pick i absolutely love that question and so do my students because that's a question on their second exam in our math 490 class which is using the thaler model the, the massey thaler model to actually price using a two parameter exponential weibull so using the numerator as the first pick as being a million dollars and it just goes down from there so absolutely and there's been subsequent work where they talk about okay if you're a football player how many games did you actually play and so based on how many games you actually played, that sort of bends you into what expected salary to get. So that's, again, very good. But if you, Massey and Thaler, I think they're in Penn. And also, you see. I just read it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so and also, it's kind of nice. Um, shoot. Um, Mathletics by Wayne Winston. He's got some nice uh, GitHub repository for some of that data. Um, but again, just for fun, we did this for our class. I gave them, the first example was, I was going to give them a two-parameter Weibull where you're trading picks for picks plus cash. And I thought, that's fine because cash can be you're playing, trading for another player. And so you're getting that valuation for that current player. Fitting a two-parameter two two parameter Weibull is, especially if you're using like mean square loss, is not fun. So I, I reduced it to one parameter, facing an exponential. But yes, you can absolutely do this. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, one thing I was wondering is in your contract valuation or player valuation models, uh, you assume that the teams are profit maximizers um, as oh the my base. Goodness. Yes. And so Rockerby, when he, in that book by Rockerby, he There's assumes. There's a second book, right? You're, you're the, the, yeah. the, the race to the pennant? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And he's referring to, so then how does this apply to, for, for example, European clubs where they are considered more win maximizers than profit maximizers? And how can that be extended? So win or reputation maximizers, absolutely right. And, and there's, there's not really a good answer I have for that because there is no good answer. I mean, so the, the, the sort of debate, the academic debate is, do teams maximize reputation or do they maximize profit, reputation being wins? And some people say it's cyclical. If you have a high you know, reputation team, they're winning a lot, people are going to come, they're going to buy your T-shirts. It doesn't really hold very well. So the only thing I can say is that in a salary cap league, which – Rocker Bean Easton in their second book, thank you for mentioning I didn't put up there. They talk about that. You know, you have these perennial favorites like the, the White Sox, oh, sorry, the Red Sox and the, uh, the Yankees. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Chicago. <laughs> sorry. Um, but in essence, yes, you're right. So it's, it's a huge deal if you have an uncapped versus a capped league. But I don't have a really good answer for that because that's an ongoing debate. Hi. Um, thanks again. This was, uh, this was really great. Um, so in terms of, this is kind of a little bit piggybacking 
Um, but, you know, using kind of the Pythagorean expectation and looking at an individual player's contributions, have you thought at all about maybe synergy? So, for example, in basketball, it's not the sum of all five players, but like a point guard on one team may have a certain contribution. But if he plays with a great pick and roll center, they both make each other better. Uh, I'm curious, like how you might incorporate something like that into uh, this kind of a model. Well, again, in financial valuation, correlation is everything, right? You're going to make a pairs trade. And if you can have them highly correlated, then, you know, you can make a a lot more money you not you didn't do it the right way so finding correlations between players is fantastic um, I think I think it's Kwong that basically was talking about you know take tools from other areas um, there are a lot of these tools off the shelf like um, credit default swap modeling copula methods these kinds of things that I think would fit in your, what you're saying um, but it kind of goes back to what James and I are working on now which is a player fraction of the contribution um, which is a sort of a reworking of the Tunaru uh, Biney Clark paper from 2005. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, we have one. Hi, uh, I really like the framework, and I just wondered when you uh, were mapping from uh, performance to uh, revenue to uh, salary, can your model expand to consider supply side considerations such as, I, I think there was a paper by David Berry, it was like a short supply of tall players or tall people. And so the, getting at this notion that, okay, I can stack up a lot of wins at the guard position uh, cheaply, but I, I have to reconcile the fact that, you know, maybe in basketball there are five positions or something, kind of these sorts of things. I assume you can easily incorporate that. I just wondered your, your thoughts on the, the, the supply side of, of uh, salary. Yeah. Thank you. So it goes back to that scarcity and liquidity issue. Like, can you actually find what you're looking for? Yes. And so I, I guess I think that's why in free agency you sometimes see teams overpaying. And just to kind of add to your point just a little bit is that when I did DR, it's PDQ, but you can also say QDP, right? So you can have that level, but you can also say the ticket price changes. If you sign Leo Messi, that makes a huge difference, right? So absolutely, yes. And having those kinds of players are scarce, and so that would also be in the DP term. Thank you. All right, let's thank Albert for the fantastic job. We have, please, you, get, you, you can't go away, you get swag also. <laughs>